Today, I'm sitting down with Oriel Frank, co-founder of the luxury British skincare brand Elemis. Launching with the concept of skin wellness over 30 years ago, Elemis remains an industry leader, and I cannot wait to uncover the journey behind it all. Hi everyone, and welcome to Founded Beauty, a podcast dedicated to beauty entrepreneurs built some of the biggest brands today, and where we learn exactly how they did it. We'll cover some of the most intimate stories, their path to success, and how they overcame the obstacles along the way. I'm Akash Mehta, CEO and co-founder of Fable & Main, a modern hair wellness brand inspired by ancient Indian beauty secrets. Building Fable & Main has been an incredible journey so far, and I've decided to launch this podcast as a founder keen to learn and connect with fellow beauty brand founders around the world. I believe in collaboration over competition, and so I'm using this platform as a way to hopefully help and inspire each other in what can be quite a tough and lonely journey. So if you are an entrepreneur or simply just curious how to build a brand, this podcast is perfect for you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Oriel Frank. She is the co-founder of the wellness-focused skincare brand Elemis, joining forces with Noella Gabrielle and Sean Harrington over 30 years ago to push the boundaries of beauty and develop a lifestyle concept. As Chief Product and Sustainability Officer, Ariel's expertise in marketing, design and new product development has pushed Elemis to continually seek innovation, restore biodiversity and remain one step ahead of its industry. With a vision to become the number one global leader in skincare, Elemis is now an award-winning household name, selling in over 90 countries with beauty lovers everywhere, including myself, and incomplete without an Elemis product in their collection. Oriel is an industry disruptor and has truly inspired founders like myself with her commitment to remaining at the top of the game. So it's an absolute honor to sit down with her today. So thank you for being here, Ariel. Oh, it's my pleasure. Lovely to, to, lovely to be here with you. So I ask all my guests the same question. I'm, I'm going to ask you, <laughs> and it's quite a tough one, but I'm curious to see your response. Who in a nutshell is Ariel? <gasps> wow. Gosh, that's a tough question. It's a tough one. I'm glad I don't get to answer that because I don't um, know what I would say. <laughs> you know, I, I always think of myself as I'm a real positive. I always look very optimistically at, at life. Yeah. And that might be because of my past, and I, I can tell you a bit more about that. But um, very optimistic. Everything is achievable. Everything can be done. And about collaboration, mm. about working together, quite caring, quite nurturing. Yep. I, I'm not very cutthroat. My work has also been very much part of my friendships. Yeah. And these people here are like my family. You know? And ultimately, we all have a life to live. Yep. We all go through ups and downs. And actually... You know what? You're you're at work so much of that time. We have to work together for yeah. success. That's if I was going to be asked that question, I think those are the elements I would say. So I already know this is going to be a great conversation. <laughs> it's a really, I think, such a powerful way to to think about and when you're going into a beauty industry because it is mm -hmm. often governed with a lot of different types of uh, personalities and and even goals. Right? Some are just mm. to create profit. Some is to create um, movement. Some is to create a sustainability agenda. I think that's going to be mm. a big part of as well, our conversation. Yeah. But I want to go back to the point where you said about the past. I think mm -hmm. without starting there, we can't build that story. So tell me a little bit about your upbringing and if you can diffuse an element of your first introduction into beauty through yes. all of that, that would be amazing. Yes. I mean, look, I come from um, a Dutch mother and a Dutch English father. My father is a Holocaust survivor, uh, which has a huge impression of being a child of a Holocaust survivor. They went to Canada in the 60s. It was the land of golden opportunity. Um, loved the open space, you know, of Canada. Uh, came back here when I was five and, uh, you know, spent the rest of my uh, days here in, in London. Yeah. A Londoner. Londoner. West myself. Londoner. Yep. <laughs> but beauty for me, I, I used to love being in my, my mother's side, um, my grandfather was a bulb grower, but his art form was to create new varieties of tulips, daffodils and irises in the outskirts of Holland. And we'd go and visit him and we'd spend time in his massive greenhouses with these lilies and the smell. So for me, beauty immediately was about plants and, and nature wow. and aroma. If I smell lily of the valley or, mm. or, or or lilies in particular i think of him yeah and and i remember going to one of his uh it was the christening of one of his new varieties at kokenhof which is is the kew gardens of, of amsterdam 
And, you know, there, there was a whole big ceremony to announce the launch of this new variety. So for me, there was always sort of nature. Um, I was always outdoors. My, my dad was loved restoring old buildings. Mm. We'd go to the country every Friday and he would restore 16th century cottages in the Cotswolds and I'd be out outdoors the whole time discovering fossils and and feeding the chickens and mm. you know so I've always been very drawn to sort of nature nature mm. and I think I love the, the diffusion of nature with innovation right mm. because that's very much there where it's like not just doing the same your mm. grandfather was also trying to create something new right yeah. and I think that especially at that time would have been so might have been really hard to do but also a new concept as well like why would you change something like a tulip or yeah. a lily or and i think yeah. that's really exciting because i think with that you can see new new, new horizons i guess mm. especially when it comes to beauty so innovation is very important and i think that's going to be a big story as well with elemis mm. when we get a bit deeper into it i want to talk a bit about then you know you're most spent most of your life in london um I, I believe you went to kingston university yes so tell us what was your initial path? Because we have a lot of students listening. I think it's really interesting to know what was your mindset when you were about to apply and thinking about your career at that early stage? Yeah, I mean, I look, I didn't follow the sort of the perfect mm. path. You know, I went to an all-girls school and didn't do as well as I should have done and went to retake college, which is where I actually met the other founder, so, Mr. Sean Harrington. So meant to be, and, meant to be, uh, yeah. I worked for his father, who was in the beauty industry, and he was quite an entrepreneur, and I had my Saturday job with him. I didn't really, I was one of, I was like, you're an all-rounder. Mm. You know, I loved biology, I loved sciences. I actually wanted to do physiotherapy and work hands-on, but I hadn't done biology A-level. So, you know, everything is to do with these three subjects that you've chosen. Yeah. So I went to Kingston to do business, yeah. and it was a four-year degree with sandwich course, so yeah. six months of, of it, I went to Toronto and uh, I worked in banking and soon realized that <laughs> however much that my father had done that, that this was never going to be my yeah, it's not for you. My you path, it, yeah. but I certainly learned, you know. That, By trying it. Yeah, really and also learned. learned, you know, that, that whole industry and, and mm. what drives people. And then my second six months that I did, I worked for a, a very progressive, probably one of the leading top agencies in, in London. Uh, sort of in those days, it was like a sales promotion marketing agency mm. but again I learned I was put on the account of uh, Marlboro Lights and in those days you could smoke in your office and yeah. they had free cigarettes and I wasn't a smoker so I, I spent quite a bit of time thinking oh my god I can't believe I'm having to market something I don't believe in yeah and I was also put on Carlsberg Special Brew to and both my briefs as a student was you need to encourage younger people to take up smoking and drinking wow. and I came away going oh my gosh I even though they offered me a job at the end of it and it would have been fantastic it was well paid I thought I can't do this I cannot work for a company where I don't believe in the product and the ethos so I, I had lots of little learning curves along the way yeah. and I finished my degree still didn't really know what I wanted to do and went off traveling for nearly two years so I was nearly seven years before I actually found yeah. my feet. Um, did get to study in Thailand. I studied traditional Thai massage so cool. in yeah. Chiang Mai, which I really wanted to do and thought maybe I could be a therapist. But came back to London, no job. Yeah. Got in touch with the Harrington family. Who you met And uh, Sean, yeah. who I'd been at college with, and his father offered me a job. And that's really, he, he really, John Harrington, was really... Uh, he taught me a huge amount. Mm. You know, he was distributing um, uh, some French brands. Fitomer mm. was one of them, this beautiful seaweed brand. And uh, I kind of learned a lot from him um, on, on business and beauty. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think one takeaway I really felt with that is it's okay to try things growing up, especially in your early years of career. And if you realize it's not for you, like there's a blessing in that because mm. you can either close that chapter or learn from it yeah. and move on. So a lot of people, I think, especially starting their, their early career, they get very nervous about making the right decision. I think it's okay to like just be curious and try. Um, sometimes, I'm sure if I asked you the question, would you go back and not do those experiences that you didn't like? You probably mm. would say no, because it wouldn't have made you where you are today. Yeah, it's very, I mean, very important. I have three boys mm. and it's interesting now seeing them coming to that junction as yeah. well. You know, one is the eldest is medic. Medic. He's following the, you know, no breaks. Yeah. 
And the, the middle one is in Australia, enjoying life, yeah. working. And, you, you know, everybody has to find, find something that, uh, for me, I'm like, find something you're passionate about. That's, something you enjoy. Exactly. You know, number one. And, and honestly, if you do that, you will end up finding success in, mm. in any form that you, you see it. Yeah. Uh, I, I studied engineering for four years and I, it was actually through the act of failing my second year when I went back and, passed, and finished my degree. But that was the moment where I took a moment to stay, take a step back mm. and be like, do I want to spend my rest of my life doing this? And A, I'm not very good at it. Um, <laughs> but B, I don't enjoy it. So I went into the beauty industry as an unpaid intern at Estee oh, really? order. And uh, within two months, I became the youngest ever manager globally because I was passionate. Mm. So that speaks, you know, I had yeah. no path set out, mm. but I knew, I'm sure if I like it and I'm happy, things will come into place. Yeah. And I think it's something that I think is very important for people to realize is sometimes we make decisions and it's okay to pivot mm. and it's okay to completely go 360 in another direction. I mean, they hired me for social media with an engineering, <laughs> engineering degree. So that says something, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. So then you met the Harrington family a bit later yes. on, I mean, uh, to actually talk about business and you started yeah. working. So when did this moment of Elemis start? Well, it, it wasn't just like a moment yeah, like, like that. Yeah, like Let's Go, you yeah. Know, um, the Harrington family worked with another family called the Steiner family. Yeah. They were very much uh, hairdressers. They would be the Queen's cosmetician. Uh, there was a, a fantastic history of this family based in Grosvenor Street. And they also operated hairdressing salons and cruise ships. Oh, wow. And this this relationship sort of came together where there was a lady called Linda Steiner and she was the investor because we were poor students, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. She was the investor uh, behind Elemis and had this idea with this chemist, uh, Jan Kuzmerich, who I've literally just been on a call with and I still work with him today, That's which amazing. I love. And he's That's in his so 70s cool yeah. and having that consistency. And Sean, Sean joined to be really kind of the, the young salesman and the, 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 the guy on the road mm -hmm. and uh, Noella joined to, she was the therapist. Yeah. So she was bringing her hands, her knowledge as a therapist, her passion behind the, the beauty industry. And I came, came on as brand and marketing. And, and for, for quite a few years, we were working together and we were crafting the brand, how it was going to grow. And Linda Steiner retired. And it, that was a real turning point where we kind of really sat down and, and we were like, we need to have a, a rebranding, mm -hmm. repackaging, redesigning, reformulation, which I've probably been through three times in the in the lifetime of the LMS. We do, yeah. But you know, it really has always, and actually, even now today, you know, Sean still is the business strategist. Mm. He loves that. You know, move to Asia so he could spearhead APAC. Move to America so he could spearhead America. Learn there's and always learning about how businesses work. Um, globally yeah you know and Noella really grew in not only in that sort of therapy role and still will both of us will still be in the product and the product development but she loves that treatment side and the spa side and the wellness side but also she is an absolute um gem of of a communicator she is the she would have been an influencer in her day 30 years ago you know because she when she talks people just fall in love with how she talks about the product yeah, the and passion. she ha yeah and she has that therapist knowledge of, of the skin and and you know I was very much a, the story was always that I was always behind the two of them clearing up everything that the, the that they were out there being so busy yeah. um but it was like that in the early days you yeah. know that so you were learning on the job and learning packaging learning product development and learning you know, design and, yeah. learning marketing yeah so it, it, it must be hard because even though you say you know you're predominantly brand and marketing I know you would probably be like but I was also doing that this yeah. this, this, this. It's, it's, oh yeah it's and that's the beauty of it at the beginning as well and even today right it, uh, you know every uh, almost every six months I'm like right what's going to be my next six what's, months you know yeah. and through having different four different owners mm -hmm. we have learned so much and had to pivot and you know four different owners and also different moments of this whole world being mm -hmm. the pandemic being one yeah. and then uh, shifts in consumer behavior and, yeah. and new markets opening and also a lot more brands entering the market space so it needs you to innovate but I think that's one factor which I love about founders and entrepreneurs is at the, at the premise of all of it, we're the best students, we're learners. Mm. So oh my gosh, the, the, the COVID, you know, that was like, I was GM, I was general manager. Mm. I decided that that would be quite an interesting challenge. Yeah. And then sure enough, COVID came along and, you know, learning, you know, to react quickly, yeah. 
deal with something you have no idea. That too. Maybe, you know, there was, I, I tried, I reached out to other people in similar situations to see, how, you know, how they were doing it. <laughs> and, you know, my boss was in Australia where it wasn't as bad, but he still had the freshness of mind to say, do you know what? You, you're never going to get this time again. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he challenged us to, we called it Mission Possible. And we, we put together all the things that we would love to do mm. that we've never had the time to do. And we put together a 15-page paper that uh, Noella and I put together, and we set about doing that. And we came out of that pandemic so much stronger. Yeah. We developed a retail concept. We'd rebranded the, 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 the phrases, the, the words we were using. We, we really did. It's this trio that works in this yeah. very evolving way, constantly evolving. I love that, this evolving trio. I think that's something that a lot of people are curious about, like even with me, how is it like working with a co-founder? You have mm. co-founders. Is there like a sort of, and it's very hard to say this, right? But I mean, it's, it's a podcast. So let's say I'm saying a recipe, right? Mm. Is there a sort of a recipe of advice or success you would give to people to say when you are thinking about either working with co-founders, mm. what to just make sure you you do to make sure it's a success? Because it can be, you know. Oh, challenging. It can be challenges. Yeah, you hear about different some opinions, co-founders. Different, that... you, know, you, get, you hear the breakups and you hear, especially, I mean, for me, it's another problem with it's family, right? Because yes. then you have this unfiltered approach of like, I can say what I want to say. It's my sister. But um, <laughs> but same with, you know, your other, your co-founders. Yeah, I think yeah. as co-founders though, we, you know, the brand isn't named after us. So you have a certain amount of anonymity, you exactly. know, you're not, a Joe Malone or, yeah. and then you sell that brand and, and you're no longer there, but yeah. you, you know, you lose that identity of your own brand. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, in a way we've, and we've always said, this is not about the co-founders. It's about the brand. This yeah. is very much about the brand. Mm -hmm. And um, for, for us now, our job is to, to really build the next generation of teams mm. that, Yes, they can be inspired or we can give them guidance or we can mentor them. But actually, you know, I want that next person coming in as my chief brand officer who starts in two weeks. For me, my success would be making sure she is Our, set up for success and can take it to the next level. I, I know it's being a marketeer and being, a, I suppose, from, a, from 30 years ago, you know, am I really driven to... To, mm -hmm. to strategize TikTok, you know, do I really understand it? I've tried to teach myself. Am I passionate about that? Do you know what? I think I'll leave that to someone else to do, yeah, yeah, do you yeah. know? And really try and focus on the things that I'm passionate about and bring in that next gen that can really spearhead the, very, what you're doing. I think, yeah, it's exactly like the recipe I kind of even say sometimes like detach, learn when to detach your ego yeah. and attach it to, you know, the ego of the brand, what, what it needs there. It's not always about us. And sometimes you have to find that balance, right? As founders, co-founders, people do look for vision and yeah. strategy and decision making. Yeah. But And there'll be moments where you're like, I'm going to decide this. Let's just decide to do that. Yeah. But I think as long as you can build this conscious capitalist approach of like, we have so many stakeholders beyond our co-foundership, right? We have the retailers, we have the customers, we have the team. Yeah. That just is the most important thing to think about. How does it affect these people, all the decisions we make? Mm. But it's always comforting, I say, to people thinking about having a business with a co-founder is it's nice to know you're not alone because it can be very lonely and it still can be even with co-founders, but knowing yeah. that you have someone who really gets it by your yeah. side. And, and I think it's still quite unique to have so many, three co-founders to still together, yeah. still talking to each other, still getting inspired, still moving things forward. It's, you know, that's quite and, and incredible. And still, and still um, innovating, mm. going back to your grandfather, you know, yeah. like it's like, it can be very easy at this stage to just get comfortable, mm. to also be um, very just at, at ease with the idea of we've got this formula, it's mm. always going to work because yeah. it's been working with us for the last 10 years or 15 years. And I think it's when you push yourself and you yeah. drive, um, it's very, very important. You know? we, always, we always have three or four projects mm. on the go. And, I love that. You know, I literally just come off of a call about one, which is all about CO2 extraction and mm. trying to learn about how you can you know, that's sort of the chemistry of plants and this, you know, it can take five years. People don't, you know, that fast beauty that so many brands that have come out with that want to bring out brands, you know, and product, 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 product. product. But yeah. with Elemis, 
if you're going to bring out a new product, one, it has to be unique. It has to be, the texture has to be incredible, the aromatic. So it does take time. It's probably a little bit longer, but we also love to find really unique points of difference. I'd say even now, that's what I get excited about. Yeah. You know, there's a project that we're working on, which we've, we've, we've discovered um, a, a new diatome, it's called, um, from, from an area of, of, of the UK mm. where there's very pure waters. Mm. And then how can you biotechnically grow that? Um, so there's, we're always pushing ourselves in That's, different ways to sort of develop new things. And, I think, and it might happen, it might not. That's, you know? I was about to say, and, and that's the thing, it's about at least you tried. And mm. also if it didn't work, try again later. Yeah. It shouldn't, shouldn't be, a, oh, it's not going to be for us. Mm. It's about you started that journey. Yeah. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be doors in your, your way, yeah. but you have to find which one can you open and which yeah. one can you go through? But also I think what's really important, and I want to ask you in this is, which ones do you leave open for others around you? Because again, talking about the collaboration of a competition, yeah. there is a lot of brands out there. And I think, mm. have you found it over the years, um, an interesting like dynamic of um, how you collaborate or speak to other brands or not even brands, but even like, turn, like let's say chemists or... Mm. Um, I think, I mean, we've always said we, we don't copy. Yeah. And, you know, we... We quite often people don't even know don't don't we're not out there in the industry particularly yeah, yeah, we yeah. work so hard you know when we go home at the end of the day we we're, we're going home to our kids and off we go so yeah. you know I think we've kept a very sort of tight collaboration really on in terms of formulating and always just mm. trying to focus on what can we do differently exactly for me the collaboration piece has come with the sustainability about to say. and that's where I'm like look I'm having trouble trying to source certain in, you know pumps insane. or an airless yeah. pumps or, or and I, I love the fact that there's the, that I'm now part of very collaborative organizations mm. you know like sustainable beauty coalitions part of the british beauty council and cw yeah. as well you know that that you can pick up the phone now to, in, in that relationship and say do you know what i'm really struggling with this have you got any what ideas are you doing or i think um, that's where collaboration is also the same as communication i mm. think that's what you don't have to necessarily have a uh, solution by the end but just yeah. constantly communicating on Similar topics and things that we're noticing. For me, sustainability is one of the biggest factors, right? I recently, I think you did, I did the, the Cambridge Circular yes. Sustainability Economy course yeah. in the Cambridge Judge Business School. And it was um, really interesting because the reason I did that was because I had a founder that um, I interviewed. Um, and she, um, her name is Claire Chung, and she basically did the course um, for her brand. Um, and she told me, it's amazing. You should do it. So I literally went and did it again. because. Yeah. I'm like, I'm still earning in my brand. I mean, at that point I was in a year into the yeah. journey, but I was like, but if I don't start learning, communicating, interacting with people who are similarly on that journey and curious to learn, mm. then you know, the, when I, mean, I do it? The same thing happened to me. You yeah. know, Sean said, we came out of the pandemic, you know, I'd done the GM role of, mm. of managing us through pandemic. Noella came back from America and we were like, you know what, you're the best lady to, to take this back, this gauntlet back yeah. and get this, this brand back on, it, on its feet in the UK and, and lots of Tan said, you know, we, we need someone at board level mm. that we want to champion uh, sustainability, uh, B Corp. You know, we we weren't set up as a, a, as a brand to be fully sustainable, so we got a lot of work to do. But I was asked if I would be that person. And I said, one, I'm, I've always been very passionate about that. And, but I said, I don't feel that educated enough. And so I did my research and I said, there's a great course at Cambridge. I'll, I'll continue working. So I worked full time. While doing it. And that's hard. You deadlines and I missed a lot. I had to ask for an extension. Yes. I was a bad student, I'll be honest. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I did this eight week course. And bear in mind, I hadn't studied for 30 years, you know, 35 years. It was hugely challenging because everything was online. You had to yeah. submit, you had it, deadlines. deadlines. It was an enormous amount of work. But my God, t after eight weeks, one, it was the perfect timing for me because it was all about, you know, really focusing on the issues in your industry mm. and putting together the roadmap. And so eight weeks later, having, you know, I, I really felt empowered. Yeah. And I really felt I'd, I had a lot to learn. Yeah. And I'm still learning every single day. But it just gave me a little step up of education mm -hmm. that allowed me to feel, yeah, I'm doing the right thing here. And also communicate them with your coworkers and, you know, because mm. everything you learned, that investment that you probably did for that course, which is, you know, it's not a, a crazy amount from what you're getting, yeah. 
like I've showed some of those video clip bits or the online recordings to my team. Yeah. I just summarized it. Yeah. Um, it was another way for me to just memorize it more because I'm like <laughs> teaching it again. So I had to like make sure I did the work. But um, it's it goes a long way. Yeah. And I think that's where we, university doesn't stop at mm. the, the typical age. It, you always can learn. And yeah. there are some amazing online quick courses you can mm. do. Like and I, weeks I've actually encouraged a lot of people, maybe my generation, who are a little bit of, you know, their roles have changed so dramatically, the next generation's coming in. And I'm like, go and do this. Yeah. Go and do these courses because you will feel, you know, if you can educate yourself. And several, I probably know about four or five people. Mm. And it's changed their pathway. Yeah. You know, they're, they're now going to be able to do that for other companies and very, it's very great. Important. So just to rewind a bit to Elemis um, mm. and the beginning of the name of Elemis, is there a story behind the, the inspiration behind the word? Well, Ele and me is, can actually be separated out and the very ancient Hebrew word for like above and below, which I love because yeah. it was like, oh, we source from above, but we also source from below the seaweed. Um, yeah, so Elemi. That's, That's beautiful. quite simple. Ah. And then now for anyone listening, I'm sure everyone knows the brand, but just in case, can you do a little pitch of what, what you stand for, what you do, and then maybe talk about some of the hero products? I mean, Elemis has always been about a way of living, mm -hmm. um, not just about skincare. So, you know, we, we say we're a well wellness skincare brand. Mm. I think, you know, we always look at the person as a whole. Mm. So it's about your lifestyle your diet, uh, your exercise, and your skincare regime. And we've from day one, that was always our philosophy, and it's it's remained with us um, ever since those days, you know. And that that your body changes from day to day, from week to week, yeah. to, through different hormones changing, through when you have children, when you, you go through a very stressful time. You know, the skin reacts. The skin is the largest organ of the body, and people forget that. It's live, yep. and it needs nurturing. And so, you know, we're very much about the skin, um, but we're very much about looking at that person as a whole. We're a treatment-led brand. Yep. Um, you know, we've veered off a few times where maybe sometimes we haven't been so focused. It's now really going to be another back to our, our, our heritage. Yep. We do that really, really well. Um, and that's that time. We always say that we probably spend more time with people than most of those fast brands. Um, it's about listening, you know, asking the open questions. Noella would say there's six questions she can ask and she'll know everything about, you know, what you're going through, you know, your sleep, your stress levels. So it, I'd say it's a very, it's a very authentic brand. Yeah. Um, you know, our formulations um, have been incredibly complex you know it takes us a long time to develop product because we are we test everything ourselves yeah. gets passed by us at some point sometimes it could be 55 formulations i think you know my proudest two products probably are the, the cleansing balm yeah. and the marine cream the marine cream was an interesting one i, I met the scientist behind uh, one of the ingredients and it was fascinating and he was a, a diver and he loved um exploring and he'd pulled the seaweed off a shipwreck and found that the wood was preserved underneath it which I found fascinating mm. you know that the seaweed the, the benefits and you know th then that sort of went into a professional product and and we didn't think to put it into a retail product which took a long time and eventually we then developed our first ever skincare product because when we first started with Elemis we had like 12 essential oils we had body products we were five body oils it wasn't skincare which is quite unique to have pivoted over the 30 years to now be the number one premium it makes sense from the whole well-being yeah too which is often oils and aromas yeah so that, I mean they were beautiful and we still yeah. have there's a few that still there. Japanese camellia oil was one of the founding uh, products um, the essential oils blends are still we love to bring them in um, the aromatic the whole the, the, for us, a product is 360. Mm -hmm. It's the aromatic. How does it make you feel? How does it feel on, on your skins? I think now we have to make sure that it works on all skin types, exactly. different skin types. Yeah. So we now test on a US skin, on an APAC skin, on a UK skin, and we, we read that feedback. Mm -hmm. So it takes us probably, I'd like to think it was 12 months, but I think it's probably more like 18 months. Yeah. We also, anything that we want to really do something, mm. we do clinical tests yeah. and before and, and after. Invest in them, it's so important. And, 
you know, the, the pro-collagen is a really good example where mm. that was the first clinical trial we did. And we got this big document back from the independent testing house saying, basically, your product isn't, doesn't do anything. And we sat around the table going, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Do we launch this? Do we not launch this? Was, there was no way we can launch a product mm. that we'd formulated to do something. Um, and so we had to pay to start again. We had to reformulate. We had to do a second clinical trial. I think, remember in those days, I think they were about £17,000. But you know what? I always say that, again, was a bit of a turning point because we had, the, we had the guts to turn around and say, that is not good enough for us. And you didn't sacrifice the, 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 the yeah. brand, what, what was right for the brand. Yeah. You know? And then we got this phenomenal clinical trial and, and we launched it. Yeah. But I could never have dreamed that that product would be the number one Yeah. You know. But brand and that it was thankfully you guys had the decision making power to say no we're going to reformulate it to make it Absolutely. work yeah um and, and invest in clinicals because if you don't do the clinicals yeah you will not really have the data to prove that yeah um because yeah. perception is you know i always say for people starting brands today there's perception trials and, and for a startup brand sometimes that's the first only option like yeah. give it to 20 people near dear and friends and get a blind survey you can get some great results for social media yeah and but often when it's a perception thing, you don't really people sometimes think, I think it works, but there's so many factors, right? Yes. They might be eating healthy that week. They might have had other products they're using. Yeah. But a clinical on that product yeah. is so crucial when you can start to invest. And yeah. you can go up to millions of dollars of investment yeah. with these products. You know, it's expensive. Yeah, it's getting more and more expensive. More and more. So we do that and that that's absolutely key. Mm. And then, you know, you learn all the time. The cleansing balm was was a classic one where I think thirty-three formulations and we 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 nailed it. We nailed it. Obviously. And but you, when you when you're doing lab formulations, they 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 have to also then look at how they scale that up. And when we went to scale up, they said we can't. We're not going to be able to achieve this. Or the lab itself. You yeah. know. So we had to go back to the drawing board on that one. And again, that cleansing balm, I would have never imagined that. Today it's it. now our number one. Everywhere. It's, it's a new. It's it's a new texture. Yeah. It, it's unique. Um, you know, there's still lots of dupes out there that people are trying, but no one's quite mastered it. it it's unique to us. And and then finding out actually that people want different flavors of it. They yes. want different aromatics. That's, That's exciting. exciting. No, no, yeah. it's exciting when you've got that hero pillar. And I think one thing I encourage brands today is, is, you know, retailers will often tell you newness, newness, newness. But I think the big, biggest brands of today are the ones that have got their hero product yeah. and have got that uh, product that no matter what, people will always come back to and if they want more colors and smells that's, that's yeah. a really good sign that they love it yeah. that much that they're willing to even experiment out of that yeah. so yeah i mean important. it was a real moment we do you know getting that hero product mm. that is if you look at other brands you know there's only one you only need one or two yeah. but then we were talking about this earlier is that yeah. you know when you start in 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 these businesses you, you know you've got lots of gaps to fill 30 years later you filled a lot of your gaps. Yeah. So then the MPD pro product, product development becomes much tougher. Yeah, much tougher. Because, yeah. you know, you've got to really find magic. And you can't contradict something you've said in the past. I worked at Dior for many years in the head office and often we had a new launch and I was like, wait, this is a plumping lip thing, but and the last one you said it plumped too. So now which one do the consumers buy? Yeah, it's very confusing. Yeah. That's the unfortunately that's a, the, the the birth of like uh, the issue of when you create a lot of products and you yeah. have to bow down to retailers just for newness. Yes, you create a brand that's built on short term shelf life, which is not yeah. sustainable. Yeah, very confusing to the consumer mm. and often can actually kill a business because yeah. you might overinvest in the launch and be disappointed. And yeah. the consumers today are much more educated than ever before yeah. and demand transparency. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's very important to, but then do you feel like with that, you're, you guys are switching to like just creating when it's needed. So no longer yeah. bowing down we're, to we're, we're definitely launch. Or, fewer, bigger, better yeah. is the mantra. It's very important. We launched 22 products during COVID. I don't know what we were thinking. Our private equity wanted lots of turnover, mm. and that's we were still on that. We'd had this pipeline; we were going to deliver it. But actually, if you think about it, newness during COVID, well, there was only digital, and mm. digital, you know, was online. There was a bit of shopping TV, and that was it. Yeah. Bar was shut, so, retail was yeah. shut, and actually, newness launching on in the digital platform is it's not it's not the easiest. And it's also, I would say, even apart from expensive, it's just luck. It's virality at that yes. point. Yes. 
that's what I mean. We we launched in the pandemic, and our brand only survived that pandemic because we went viral on TikTok. Yeah. Then we had this hero product, and mm. it's actually quite hard because you have an amazing other products, but people still will be like, "But you only have an oil, no?" And I'm like, "No, we have like seven other products, you know." <laughs> um, but they still just see that one product because yeah. of TikTok, you know. Yeah. So that's a hard part as well. Is how do you then start to build the ritual and the brand's DNA? Yeah. And that's where retail now, thank God, it's bouncing back, right? Mm. Having that space to, to really showcase. The experiential, yeah. Experiential. And then also salons or a spa. Yeah. So that must be a big factor for you guys is going back to the therapist mm. angle with no- Noella too. Yeah, I mean, we're just kicking off. We're kicking off a couple of really, really exciting projects. Mm. We're reimagining the brand mm. as the most sustainable brand. And what would that be? And then we will transition that over the next three years. That's a massive project. Yeah. Um, and, and also, you know, we've we just kickstarted a whole sort of treatment development. Because, you know, you do it in cycles, really. You, you, you launch treatments and then they're out there for four or five years. It takes a long time to educate everyone. Um, and by the time all the salons and the spas, they, they're all doing those treatments. Yeah. But you do need to you know, be constantly looking at the next generation. We have a machine called Biotech, but what is Biotech 3? We're sort of trying to future-proof kind of the, yeah. how how that that side of the business, that hands-on piece, that treatment piece, that electrical piece, yes. how's that changing? You know, we talked about sustainability and everything, um, but I do want to talk about marketing because also mm. that's, you know, your bread and butter at the beginning as well. Yeah. Um, it is hard for a lot of brands today because you want to include everyone and often you hear a lot that, some of the baby boomers that are feeling isolated because a lot of the marketing noise today for brands or priority was the Gen Zs. Mm. I recently did a, I went to a, in Business of Fashion Voices, there was McKinsey speaking about general Generation Z. Generation Z even say they're not uh, loyal. They're in experimental mm. modes. So they don't even know what they want. They don't even know what they like. But then you have all these brands investing in this generation that don't even know if they even mm. will be loyal with you tomorrow. Yeah. How have you found this balance of like, and especially post-COVID of now targeting the right... I think we're still very much testing and learning all the time. I mean, the US is a perfect example. You know, you invest a huge amount to capture that audience and how much of it really converts. Yeah. You know, um, I think there's a real art about trying to create a brand Mm. where the daughter, the 22-year-old, the loves the brand mm. but her mother also loves the brand that is something. and and but and that i think you do through your brand architecture so you know we've got this entry point of superfood which is very mm. much our glow it's a lower price point it's not got the clinicals it's about great skin health yeah um but that will require a different marketing uh to something that's 80 90 pounds for a, a fantastic clinically trialed skin you know anti-aging or yeah. you know and I think it's all about really understanding the communication tools to use. Mm. And, you know, we're, we're, we're probably TikTok, we're just starting to really focus on. Yeah. In the, we're starting in the US. We've seen some great success. But what we're finding is something like the cleansing balm seems to straddle all age groups. And then that's something you've got to hook on to. It's just incredible. It's an amazing way to gateway into a lot of different yeah. generations and I think going to your point how cool would it be like how in beauty you don't often see this um in fashion like I know my mom and my sister they always share clothes right yeah and they always are like when they go to packing for a trip for example they'll be like okay what do you bring okay I'll bring that bag will you bring that dress but they never go to the what do you bring in your beauty yeah. you know beauty trolley or whatever they, they don't say that yeah and why can't they share the same cream yeah. um, I mean I get it. Sometimes like you have a little pot and you just want to keep it to yourself. But, <laughs> but generally speaking, I think it can, or at least talk to each other about what's in your you know, makeup bag. Yeah. Um, often you don't see that. I think as well, like for instance, the cleansing balm, mm. we've managed to find an appeal through makeup artistry. I to say, yeah. You know, so, and there is that culture of wearing a lot of makeup. Mm. Or drag and, queens. And there's a lot yeah. of this where you can. So, you know, that cleansing balm will remove everything. And exactly. it's very visual. Yeah. So, you know, even when it, you know, we do the wonderful Halloween makeups. You can just and see it on just a TikTok. Thunk, off yeah. it goes. And it's so visual. Yeah. You know, and I, there is a different audience, audience. watching that t- TikTok. So yeah. I think it's marketing is, is all about now adapting. One, you've got to think what. For us, a, a gl- growing a global brand, the UK, you've got a, you've got a very developed, you know, we, it's the home of the brand. Mm. Most people have heard of the brand. America is still, it's still uh, new. 
and then you're launching in these new countries where no one's ever heard of you. So you not only are having to market to educate people as to Mm. what is the brand, Mm. um, you're also having to then also, what is your target audience in that market? And what um, areas are you going to be marketing? Because we're an omni-channel brand. Mm. So, you know, we, we, we sell in so many different channels. Mm. You've got to really adapt the marketing. One, to the consumer. Two, in the channel. Yeah. And, and three, depending on whether people have even heard about the brand. Exactly. And it's a, it's a hard balance. Yeah. Well, we're going to go to fire run soon, but sort of the future of LMST, I and mean, we touched on a lot of different things, mm. but to summarize, what are you most excited about what's coming oh, I'm really excited. This year feels very exciting. That's so cool to know. I love it's that. It's really brilliant. Yeah. Um, you know, when you, we, we, I think there was a question about the hardest thing that you've done. And I think yeah. for me, going through four owners, I don't think, you don't know it at the time, mm. but that ch- constant change and adapting to the next owner, the next owner, and everyone having a pivoting and changing and pivoting and changing, you know, moving my whole team to America yeah. and, and then moving them all back and starting afresh a here now. Um, but for me, the, the acquisition by Lots of Time Group has yeah. been, that has been probably the most exciting time for me that, yeah. that they've acquired our group. They, I love their philosophy. I love the fact that they want to invest in brands of a similar ethos of yes. nature and, yeah. and purpose, putting that purpose back into the brand. Exactly. So, you know, when you've been in somewhere 30 years, most people say, God, you know, have you, you know are, how are do you, you are keep... Are you bored? Are you tired? Yeah. yeah. But this is really exciting. That's so You know, know. We're, we're, we're already two or three years in and actually I feel we're, we're even stronger together. You know, we've just gone through the B Corp journey. Yeah just got B Corp, um, announced it last week. Uh, they're going through their B Corp journey yeah. and hope, hope to announce that later in the year. But, you know, that that focus and that um, excitement has, has been triggered really, really by being part of the group Lots of Tan. That's so that's amazing. been amazing. And, you know, people will often say, you know, you're acquired by a brand, the co-founders yeah. leave, they last a year. Bittersweet moment. Yeah. You hear that this all the time. This is quite unique that, yeah. these, that we're still completely dedicated and, and really want to help set this up for, for success. So, yes, there is ambition. It's big ambition. And it's going to happen. And, and it's great to know that you're with more support. And yeah with the right support, right? The people and the boards that believe in what you want to do. Yeah. And I think you said it's such an important fact is put it back in the brand, yeah. not put it back in our pockets. Yeah. I think that often happens when it comes to bringing in people, acquisition. It's, yeah. okay, this exit strategy. And it kind of goes to the point where you were saying a lot of brands in the industry are chasing a thousand percent growth because yeah. why? They want to exit in two years and that yeah, growth exactly. is healthy for evaluation. But instead, if you're focusing on growth for the business, put it back in the brand, yeah. which is often slower, yeah. often takes time. Yeah. I think people will start realizing it and feel yeah. it. So, I mean, I had a big conversation with my retailer the other day, Sephora, and I was like, I'm really honest with you. I'm here for the long run. So if that brand is doing that, I don't need to know that benchmark because I know they'll exit in two years. Yeah. I am here to grow. And if I do grow, I'm very sure I want to partner, for example, with a Lositan, yeah. someone that can I can still continue that journey. Because I have heard, I'm not going to mention names, I've heard horror stories and a few of them we might know, where yeah. you sell to a conglomerate and oh. then goodbye, non-compete exists, see you I mean, going through that sale process, yeah. another big learning curve for me. Yeah. You know, 18 companies. And I'm sure you, you had to Standing to so in front, many. we had to speak to them, we had yeah. to sell the brand. Yeah. And, you know, there was a moment there when, you know, when Lots of Tan came in and I just thought, oh, you know, it, it would have been a very different story if it had been many of those other companies. Mm-hmm. But we just, it was just right. meant to be. I think the stars were aligned. What I love is, you know, they have ambition, but they're also saying you've got to have a purpose yeah. and we want you to give something back. Mm-hmm. And it isn't just about what I love. And, and I think it's a bold statement, but, uh, you know, uh, Reinhold Geiger was talking about it the other day, who, who's, you know, the, the chairman of of Group Lots of Tan, and he was saying, there's there's nothing wrong with making profit. We have to make profit. Exactly. It's positive to make profit. Our success and making profit that we can then also give back some purpose, you know, really think about the planet and people. And that's a big turning turning like, point for us. how you rethink of things. Yeah. It's not like you should feel guilty about making money. It's about what will you do with that? Exactly. What impact will you make? You know, so it's yeah. super exciting because we know we're in this really new sort of 
uh, the next generation of the brand. Mm. But it feels it feels really right for the brand, which yeah. I think is is a lovely feeling when you've been there for thirty years and you know actually it's going in a, such a positive direction. And anyone joining at the moment, I feel they feel that I'm hoping that that that, that it's their next. 10, 20 years. No, ago. And, and I've, you know, like often I've spoken to a few people that have now recently joined the company, right? And they're so excited. Mm. And you often get the stigmatisms, unfortunately, with brands that have existed for many years. Yeah. That, oh, I want to go to a new startup. I want to go somewhere. But actually you can encourage them. But this is a brand with heritage, with structure, with um, amazing products. But it's also like a startup. We're yeah. also learning new things. Yeah. We're trying new things. Um, and I think that's an exciting atmosphere or like an environment yeah. to be around yeah no i mean it still has that you know yeah. uh, to be honest the world's our oyster if they want to do something exciting yeah. and new they... i mean you have exactly said you have new markets you haven't yeah. even touched you have markets you want to penetrate and you have markets to nurture and to keep uh, alive yeah. so it's a lot to do um yeah. and i'm really excited for the journey ahead <laughs> um so fire round questions are coming up and then we'll wrap it up because i know you have a business to run um but i have a desert island question first you can imagine. I know it's so, so cool, um, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, you're invited to a founded beauty retreat. Um, so it's a desert island. It's hot, um, but you can only bring one product. What is your go-to product? Well, it's going to have to be an Elemis product. Uh, only Elemis. Yeah, yeah. This, only Elemis. I, it would have to be cleansing balm. Yeah. Because you know what? I can use it for rough, dry patches. Oh, it One, yeah. it makes me feel. It was the product that got me through COVID. Oh, yeah. Every morning I would just do my in. I, I'm a big believer in breath work, breath work. Oh, so I do my breathing I would take that one minute of smelling those incredible nine essential oils mm. so that would mentally that Set product mentally right would get me through that's amazing and then as I got really you know I was making my fires I'd be able to keep my myself clean exactly. and, uh, and oh it'll be a bit more I'll, I'll <laughs> up on the next 10 and so it's not going to be survivor mode oh, but, okay. <laughs> but so yeah. yeah I think and, it, and it's very nourishing and nurturing because there's some fantastic uh, um, oils in there as well you know we that product we actually have the fields are about three hours from here we grow the fields of the borage and the star flower and it's oh, incredible that's so cool they're yeah, local really that's oh, that's amazing yeah. so fire round questions there's three questions so the first question is what's another beauty brand so not elemis that you're currently loving right now i mean i put chanel on this morning so chanel, yeah. it's chanel 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 yeah um i think they do the most amazing job you can say i, and I love so you can say that now <laughs> i i i you know the fact that heritage but reinventing yeah, themselves doing, yeah, yeah. so you know i do love that mm. it's interesting seeing what dior are doing actually the lvmh doing some incredible sort of statement pieces out there what they did with harrods and yeah, paris exactly. that's quite incredible i as you can tell i don't wear a lot of makeup and, and, and i only use elemis yeah. and i'm i'm quite you know i i, I don't do botox or anything like that yeah. very natural in yeah. my beauty so uh, yeah, I'd say a fragrance for me is I, I do love. I will always, you know, fragrance, love, love fragrance. It's mm. wonderful. Oh, that's amazing. My, my second question is, do you have a favorite quote or a saying that you keep close to your heart? It's a hard one. I don't know. If, or like someone, like a, like a mantra, I guess someone has still told you. Gosh, you could have told me that in advance. <laughs> I know. That's why I say fire around. <laughs> um, you know, I, my mother-in-law is 95 yeah. and she lives in Australia. And uh, I always... When things get really stressful or somebody in here says, oh, my God, something's really, really a disaster. And I just turn around and I say, look, is it life-threatening? Very true. And it's such life a grounding thing. Is it so life-threatening? And that, and it you can see you. that someone goes, it calms you. it's really you know what? Right? It's just a pot of cream. Okay. Do you know what? Yeah. We'll get around this. We'll work around it. Oh, my and God. It, so in times of any stress like that, 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 that little line comes from Wilma. Yeah. in australia oh i love i that. remember her sort of saying is that. it life no it's a very and i think so many people can use that as a guiding beacon every day because mm -hmm. we get so worked up very quickly yeah and instantly just calming yourself yeah. down and be like it's okay yeah. um, my last question is if you weren't in the beauty industry or with elemis what what would you be doing what what do you look you know what could you be doing right now Gosh, what would i be doing i would definitely be working with plants yeah this morning i was so excited i planted this mimosa and i oh my God, it's got flowers on it for the first time because it's a young tree. Mm. So I would definitely, you know, I live near Kew Gardens. I definitely work with plants, yep. but I also love people, Yeah, you know, so I love that sort of wellness. I don't know, I still feel there's a real gap 
um, in the world um, as people get older, mm. how to keep people mobile mm -hmm. and exercising and keeping strong yeah. through exercise. And true. I feel that the there's... Movement. A, yeah. And, and even, as you said, breath work. I think that's, yeah. the fact that you said that, I think not many people yeah. talk about the power of breath work. Yeah, it's, it's so, so important. True. So I think, you know, I think I'll probably continue in that sort of world of just trying to see if well I can being. help people and... Yeah. Um, look after themselves. You know, Wilma's 95. Yeah. She would swim every day if she could. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. the facilities aren't there for her to do that. Exactly. So, you know, I think we've got to find ways of helping the that, that generation mm. keep mobile and keep their brains active through movement, through, through you know, teaching them mm. um, those things. I think it's important. Thank you for sharing that. And <laughs> honestly, it's been such an honor and pleasure speaking with you. We've learned yeah. so much. And I also feel like we're going to continue talking offline as well. We're neighbors yeah. practically oh, as yeah, well. So fun. I'll come around for a coffee. Oh, likewise. it's been lovely. Thank you very um, much so for having me. Where can everyone follow Elemis and continue the journey, even yourself if you have socials? But, yes, yeah, yeah I, I have my Instagram yeah, and uh, yeah. it's Oriel Frank. Perfect. Um, we have fantastic um, Facebook, yeah. Instagram, TikTok. Go and see the new TikTok, TikTok. that we've just launched. Yeah. Uh, we have Instagram now in two countries. Yeah. We have the UK version and the, the US yes, version. Animus UKI is the UK yeah. version. And then yeah. Animus is, yeah. And then we have Facebook here in the UK. So LinkedIn. I'm a great believer in LinkedIn. I'd just say under, I mean, it's yeah. not under, but if you're in it, you're you're in it every day. But yeah. LinkedIn is so Oh, I so love, I get those bite sized yeah. bits of information. I'm learn, I learn a lot from LinkedIn. It's so true. No, amazing. Well, I'll put all the links in the summary below. So do make sure you continue to follow Oriel and Elemis on the journey. And if you're going to be curious, if you haven't tried Elemis, you want to try one product today, just get that cleansing balm straight in your basket. So I'll put all the links in the bio below. And thank you for listening. Thank you.